What the Gods Eat by Cody Goodfellow. Makeo Nahuat Shihun had lived in the jungle interior of the Yucatan all his life, and because nobody had ever promised him anything better, he believed that he was happy. He made no trouble for anyone. He had a pedicab bicycle with which to earn a living, and by collecting firewood and ferrying old women to the store in Valladolid, and a little souvenir carving and poaching on the side, he provided for his family better than most. His children had grown up, and now did for themselves. Though they lived on the coast, his sons were bellboys and his daughter a restroom attendant, yet he was not ashamed of them. They were honest and took what the world offered. Makeo was not so foolish as to deny that the old ways were dying, and soon the world must change, the Maya included. The priest in the village charged his flock to come into his hut to watch satellite television, the children all drifted to the coast to serve the legions of tourists, or to darker fates among the Spaniards in Mexico. But Maceo did not succumb to the temptations of the outside, or rail against those who pushed at the shrinking borders of their world, until the signs came to the jungle. On a morning like any other, with the sun peering through the green canopy overhead, Maceo breakfasted with his wife and dressed, and took his machete and his shotgun from where they stood beside the curtain doorway of his palapa and went outside to greet the day. His home stood in a small cluster with a dozen others of his father's clan, gathered around a wellspring and a spreading ceiba tree. They lived nearly a mile from the 180, the two-lane highway that cut across the eastern jungle, and five miles from the ruins of Koba. Though it was a chore to ride his pedicab down the narrow trail that eventually blundered into the highway, he valued the quiet and the cleanliness of the woods over the omnipresent roaring and stench of the trucks and the rattle and horn squawking of the tourists and taxicabs that plied the road. So it was with particular confusion and anger that he rounded the last bend of the trail that day and found his path and found his path blocked by a towering tree of metal. Makeo was no naive child. In his fifty years, he had seen electric lights, flush toilets, televisions, and computers, and though his soul recoiled from such wonders as witchcraft, he knew better than to infer the supernatural was at work when white men were the more likely culprits. Upon further inspection, the evil tree proved to be only a billboard. The steel trunk stood twice Makeo's height, and held aloft a single rectangular leaf, which beamed down on the highway with blinking electric lights around the red and white logo for one of the sugar drinks the whites liked. His own wife was addicted to Pepsi. Though he forbade it in his home, she held back her earnings from weaving blankets for the tourist stand at Koba to buy the syrupy poison. How long he stood there before the billboard he did not know, and he only broke out of his spell when his young cousin Ilario, who took a more sanguine view of the outside world, came down the path and stood beside him. This wasn't here yesterday, Maceo told him. Ilario studied the sign for a moment, then shrugged. What of it? Now, Maceo offered his own fatalistic gesture, but there was a frustrated impulse to strike out in his movement. He didn't know how to explain to Ilario how the billboard, which had seemingly sprouted out of the ground like an evil tree, posed a grave threat. It was a talisman, a malevolent charm beckoning the people of the forest to the illusion of a life they could not hope to grasp, though it would cost them their souls. And more, the sign itself was surely more than it appeared if only for the uncanny speed of its erection. Whenever the whites built anything, it took weeks, while workers snoozed in their trucks and cut down trees and threw trash as far as they could into the surrounding jungle. Then it hit him, how the sign must have come about, the threads of resentment in his brain nodding together into a tapestry. But this, too, he could not hope to explain to Ilario. As Maceo dragged his pedicab through the undergrowth around the billboard, his cousin offered him ten pesos to ride him to Koba. Why do you want to go there? There's no work. 
Ilario laughed. I stepped out onto the highway with no plans to await what the day will bring. And now the sign has reminded me that I am thirsty. By day's end, Makeo had convinced himself of two things. The billboards were indeed a product of white sorcery, and their invasion must be repelled. Between his home and Koba, Makeo had seen no less than 18 billboards along the highway, none within spitting distance of a village or souvenir stand, but simply standing among the trees that crowded the narrow shoulders of the road. He believed he knew now, at least, where they had come from. The cars and trucks that passed this way threw their trash out into the forest without pause, faster than the gleaners could pick them up and find new uses for them. The waste had always struck Makeo as a disgusting mystery, but now it made sense. The indestructible plastic bottles and wrappers that rained on the ground were not merely trash, but seeds, diabolical harbingers of the alien ecology of metal and plastic and advertising that had already swallowed the coast. It was a hostile invader that no one else seemed to want to fight. The dead-eyed souvenir hawkers at Koba sold the products the signs foretold. Beside the road to the ruins of the once sacred ceremonial city, a looming image of golden arches promised a still greater ritual awaiting them in Valladolid, the devouring of machine-made ghost food. Makeo could not read the words on the billboards, but he knew that they sought to infect their victims with the virus of desire. The lurid colors and explosive graphics tugged his eyes off the bumpy blacktop before him and sowed hot coals inside his brain. Even he was not immune to their appeals. Taking an alternate trail off the highway to give the infernal signs a wide berth, he resolved to stop them, to push them back as his ancestors had tried and failed to do. But how? To cut down one of the signs, even if that were possible, would only bring more. To stop them at the source, one must use guile or force, and Makeo had ample reserves of neither. What he had was the land itself, and the blood of the Maya in his veins. Blood which his father had told him once descended from the Chilambalam, the jaguar priests of Tulum, the last of the great cities, which he called by its old name Zama the dawn. From the time of the Itza invasion and the fall of the cities, the conquistadors, to 1934, the year of the last Mayan revolt, his people had fought and lost whenever they tried to defend their land because they were outmatched by guns and germs. The outsider's advantage had only grown with time, while the Maya dwindled and forgot. But he remembered. Rage brought it all back, the ways which the race of old had of old ruled its domain absolutely. He remembered, or rediscovered, a sliver of what his people had already begun to forget before the first Spaniards landed on Yucatecan soil. Oddly calm now, he parked his bike in the trees, brought his wood and pork and plantains to his palapa, and took out the chisels he sometimes used to carve ashtrays, pipes, and chess pieces for extra money. Silently, he stole into the jungle, trotting through the trackless green until he came to the edge of the forgotten cenote. He scaled the sheer limestone walls of the cenote and stooped over the spring water bubbling up out of some underground river beneath his feet. Makea knew nothing about karst topography, still less about the asteroid which had struck this very area 65 million years ago, lending its stark extraterrestrial substance to an already callous terrain. He knew only what he needed, and as he attacked the rock, he sang a chant that would have sent his clan into hysterics to hear it sung in the open. He knew that this was no blasphemy he performed, but the highest ritual act. He knew it was the right thing to do, because through his hands, the land told him so. It took Makeo a week of nights to carve the idol. He worked in an abandoned, solitary hut in the forest under the new moon in pitch blackness. Each night, 
He sat in the dark and smoked a huge green cigar until his eyes streamed and closed and his mind reeled with nauseous phantoms. His hands touched the stone, probing for the form inside it, and drove the chisel home to let it out. His fingers were shredded by mistakes and by the stone itself, which became ever more jagged and cruel as he let the true form out, but the blood made the work easier. The thirsty limestone seemed to melt and run under his tools. He never set eyes on it, never let his mind piece together the shape he liberated until it told him he was done. Even then, his mind was clouded by fatigue and double-tongued fear that it might not work and that it would. The things he carved for tourists, the Mayan calendar as an ashtray, the recumbent sacrificial god Chak Mool as a paperweight, were his deepest shame, but they bespoke the trained eye of Makeo's ancestral mastery of the stone, of craft handed down from the Golden Age. His talent was the last guttering remnant of the brilliance that built an empire unlike any other, but until he began to carve the idol, he himself had known only half of it, for this was something sacred, a vessel of crude matter into which he hoped to call down a god. When it was done, he laid it down before him in the dark, and lit another cigar. He blew the smoke over the deeper darkness before him, petrified that his eyes would adjust, even now, to the dark, and stripped the stone of the mystery out of which the divine must be conjured. Wordlessly, he began to chant. He dared not form his desires into words, dared not call the gods by name, for he knew not what god, if any, his hands had shaped. He let the chant feed on his anger, his despair, his pustulant galls of envy. As it came out, he felt himself grow light and the ground shrugging him off, and he floated up and grew afraid, for the dark inside the hut was much greater now than that without. He bowed and prayed before the idol, until the dark was so deep that his eyes might have failed, but in the end there was no answer to his prayers, no sign that his blood and sweat had yielded anything but another trinket to sell to the tourists. And what did you hope for? An angry inner voice demanded of him as he snuck into his palapa and lay down beside his snoring wife. What have the old gods ever done for the sons and daughters of the Maya? This angry voice asked its question again and again in his head, until a colder voice that might not have come from within his head at all demanded, And what have the sons and daughters of the Maya done for the gods? From the moment he opened his eyes the next morning, Makea knew this day would be different. But the cluck and chatter of his wife and neighbors, who were louder than the storm itself, he knew that it was raining. The women planned the day for their men, who would then choose to go out and work in the rain anyway, or at least hide. As his ears opened to the day, it became clear that this rain was bent on drowning out the sound of the women, so furiously did it pound the thatched roof of his hut. Such weather was far out of season, and the whole village was abuzz with news from the highway. As he dressed and ate, Makeo could not put down a curious elation, a sense that he had brought this about. Husband, the roof needs more thatching, and the other women say, I am not afraid of the rain. I will go out and work. You will stay here and protect us, his wife's cousin shattered over the din of watery bullets smashing mud. There is no other work today. The rain gods have lost their temper and the earth has swallowed the road. Makea went out to see for himself, but his strange glee grew. His wife and her family burned candles to the saints and orishas, but they knew the work of the old gods when they saw it. The rain ravaged the canopy and pelted the trail he pushed his bike along, and thunder growled on all sides. This was no ordinary rain, he knew. By the ferocity of it, he believed he knew who had answered his summons, whose image his blind hands had coaxed out of the stone. 
Chuck, the Lord of Rains, was abroad on the land. The sight of the highway brought him back to earth. There was the offensively straight black strip of tarmac, and beside it the hated billboard, though its winking electric lights had shorted out in the deluge. Ilario stood under the sign's dubious shelter, watching the road like a shipwrecked mariner on a reef. No cars, no trucks have passed all morning, he said. Surely not because of the rain. The rain has awakened the earth, an old man told me. He passed by here on his way from Tulum. He would not give me a ride. In his own time, Ilario told Maceo what the old man had said. The rain came in the night, and when the first tour bus from the hotels at Tulum took to the interior highway, it got only a mile in when the road buckled under the front wheels and collapsed into an underground river. The tourists spilled out the doors and windows of the vertical bus. Many fell into the hole and were swept away under the earth by the rushing subterranean flood. Cars and trucks backed up behind the bus, and the road buckled under them, too. Drivers abandoned their vehicles and ran back up the highway in a panic. Others fled into the jungle, but they never came out. The army and the highway patrol had closed the interior highway at the coast road until further notice. Maceo scoffed. His cousin was the worst of a lying lineage and a fool for the lies of others. Then why has nothing come from either direction, Ilario? Where are the trucks from Valladolid? Something must have happened there, too, but no one has come, not even on a bicycle. I am so thirsty. Maceo heaved his bicycle up out of the sucking mud and onto the road. Stay home and drink atole, Ilario. I will go to Valladolid myself and see what has happened but I don't think I will find any place for you to buy soda. Maceo hated the city. His eyes burned with tears that would never quite bloom, and his heart filled with cold lead at the sight and smell of it. The absence of green was an obscenity, the starved, smoke-stained trees in rows along the avenue looked like captives from a genocidal war. The stone of the city was the worst outrage. The Mayans carved stone to unleash the dormant forms of the gods, whose bones formed the earth. But the concrete and tarmac of the cities was chewed up, digested, and shed out into ugly, barren shapes, as if the old ways had not merely been forgotten, but trampled and knowingly rejected. On any other day, the sight of Valladolid would fill him with despair, but today it fueled his rage and his resolve. Today, the old ways had clearly come back, and the stones themselves seemed to have awakened. Long before he came into town, he saw the smoke, black pillars stretching up to the electric gray canopy of storm clouds. The bright tang of the rain gave way to a charnel stink of burning and decay, and gutted buildings poured smoke into the rain, embattled tongues of flame waving in the downpour. Maceo knew the city houses had pipes that fed them gas. All the fancier buildings in the city center were blasted open, while the humbler huts with no gas or running water and pirated electrical, electrical connections were spared. He knew the gas was not tamed, only contained in the hissing pipes beneath the ground. If the gas lines ruptured, the gas would burn. A platoon of soldiers came out of an alley running behind a wildly swerving jeep. The soldiers screamed and fired their rifles into the air, and Maceo took his own gun from the handlebars, but they passed him with no notice. All their attention was absorbed in the cloud of insects that besieged them despite the rain. Half the soldiers were blind, their eyes swollen shut with welts, their hands purple and puffy from countless stings. The officer in the jeep shrieked at the men to keep them running, and they disappeared down the highway presumably trying to run to the coast. Everywhere he looked, Maceo saw the land in revolt, the city collapsing all at once. But he also saw others, untouched and watching impassively from their porches as the apocalypse passed by. He saw a jaguar eating a soldier's face in the street while naked, laughing children poked it with a stick. They were Mayans, and while they seemed not to understand what they saw, they knew it to be a miracle. Maceo 
rode around Valladolid for the rest of the afternoon, ferrying women and children with their belongings to the safety of the jungle. He learned of the earth tremors and the explosions, and of how the soldiers at the post in Valladolid seemed to go berserk, evacuating from the airfield as their barracks went up in flames or collapsed in the storm. He heard of the mad stampede of cars that poured out of the town in the direction of Merida and Cancun, and of the wondrous plagues that spurred them out to the coast or ate them alive. There was worry and terror, but there was also giddy excitement and a sense that perhaps the old gods had stirred from their sleep and had not forgotten the Maya after all. Maceo listened, but told them nothing. He went back to the abandoned hut and bowed to the deepest shadows, where he knew the idol sat, for now he believed he could hear it breathing. Who has made for me this fine new body? Asked the darkness. Makeo grabbed for the ground and clung to it, fighting back waves of shivering terror as he replied, Makeo Nahuat Shihun, descendant of the jaguar priests of Zama, calls upon you. Your people have not made offerings to us for many turnings of the long count. Why now do you call? My people are enslaved. Our arts are forgotten, our cities devoured by the jungle, and the grave robbers from across the sea. We toil in the forest while every day they push us deeper into poverty and despair. We have forgotten the old ways, and the invaders have eaten our souls. We want our land back. We want the old ways. You would give me worship, then. Makeo shrank away from the idol. The old gods thirsted for blood. We would, but we did not desert your people. You abandoned us. When the gods smiled upon you, the squits of the stars of the future were yours. Your ancestors turned away from the codes of worship and fell into darkness. If I were to help you, I must have sacrifice. I will give you what you desire. Only help our people. Enough! The god thundered. It has already begun. Makeo Nahachihun. You will be my priest. As the days passed, the rains continued to fall, and Makeo's wish came true. The billboards collapsed and were consumed by avid rust. The road itself buckled and cracked as roots burrowing underneath the rain-battered tarmac broke out all at once. The black clods of tar were all but engulfed by the fresh carpet of undergrowth that covered the highway bed, and no one had come to fix it. Many in Makeo's village had seen which way the wind was blowing and abandoned their lights and televisions, but those who clung to them became oracles of a sort, repeating whatever tidbits of news they saw from the outside world. The army regrouped in Merida, had made expeditions into the forest, but many had not returned. The interior had been completely evacuated, and yet no one had come for them. Like that, the invaders had retreated into defeat. The heart of the Yucatan was theirs. The news was saying the freak tropical storm had undermined the limestone foundation of the interior, which was honeycombed with caverns and subterranean lakes and rivers. This had caused all the other events, the earthquakes, the gas leaks and fires, the animal attacks. As soon as they had given it a name, the news seemed satisfied to let it slip and the oracles fell from favor as the outside world forgot about them and their batteries died. When the rains cleared, the road sprang to life again with pilgrims walking to Chichen Itza and uh, Balan Kanche, the sacred cave. As they walked without pause, half in a trance with exhaustion, people who lived in the roadside villages joined them or simply fed them, pressing candles or gourds of corn and atole into their hands. 
the forest glowed and shivered with the light and the sounds of the old songs. Many carried offerings to Jesus and the saints and orishas, but he saw many more bearing the idols and ashtrays they'd once hoped to sell at the tourist stands, and cruder offerings of clay and stone in the vague, hopeful shapes of their savior. Maceo did not make a pilgrimage. Each day, whether it rained or shined, he rode past the hut where he'd left the idol. He did not go in or utter a sound, but he knew that it was still there, waiting for its priest. For though the disasters had claimed nearly four hundred lives, he still had offered no proper sacrifice. He did not go to the hut, he told himself, because his heart was dark with doubt. The white men knew so much, and their science and their pallid one-in-three god had succeeded in turning the land and nature against the Maya, remaking the world into a false ghost of itself. Perhaps they were right about the storms and the opportunistic spirit in the hut, if it were not a figment of his cigar-addled fever dreams, was only hoping to steal glory it had not earned. In his memory, the voice of the idol sounded like his own voice. The people were beginning to forget their initial intuition that the old gods were afoot in the land again, and lamented the death of the highway. His wife wailed for Pepsi. And then, one day as he returned from work, his wife's cries had scared the birds from the trees, and she was not alone. The whole clan mourned loudly, and when Maceo learned why, he joined them, though he could not make a sound. A jaguar had skulked into the palapa of his cousin's daughter, and stolen away with their newborn baby in its jaws. Such things had never happened in any living memory. What had they done to offend the gods? Maceo snuck away as soon as he was able to the hut. He lit a cigar and burned kopal incense before he entered. Inside the hut, the heat was sweltering, the air of the entire jungle compressed into that meager, lightless space. He sensed the presence of the god instantly. It was a struggle not to pour out his heart to the spirit he'd summoned. Gods did not trifle with the whining of those who knew death. Gods died again and again to make life, and so had no pity. And worse, he knew what the god would say, that it had been but an instrument of his will, and the child but the price of his negligence. The forces he'd unleashed, unleashed for he no longer doubted now, had come back to roost. Though he knew in his heart what he must do, he did not relish the risk. I, who am your priest, Makeo managed over the knot in his throat, I do beseech thee, O Lord of the North, Lord of the Rain, spare your people. Put down this bloody gas that I have set upon you. The work is done, and the people are freed, and you, you have dined on the flesh of a child which is most dear to you. Humbly do we plead for our lives, for the lives of the least of us, most of all. You are not free, grumbled the god, and Maceo shook, for its voice was so much stronger, and came not from the corner where he'd set the idol, but from the ground beneath his feet, from the infinite reaches of the dark above his head. You are surrounded by your enemies. Zama, the city of the dawn, is trampled by invaders, and godless temples are everywhere consecrated to their scorn for the land. This age grows old, but a new sun ripens. A new age will dawn soon upon a Mayan glory undreamt of by your ancestors. I have given you but the least of your birthright. I would give you more, but my reach. The people are humble, but their needs are simple, O Lord of the Rains, called Zakshibchak by my ancestors. Makeo's voice quavered as it threw the name into the dark. As he had carved the idol with his blood and faith, he could bind the god to his will, however fleetingly, by speaking his name. We would have our old life back and be free of invasion, but we would not be trampled by the fickle will of bloodthirsty gods either. 
he reached out for the idol, moving boldly now that the die was cast. His shin barked against stone, and he leapt back, for he had injured himself against something half as tall as himself, but the idol he had carved had been no larger than a human skull. Numb with terror, Makeo stretched out his hand to reach for the image he believed he cut into the stone, the beetle-browed visage, the rearing proboscis tentacle, the fanged mouth of Chuck, and, in his mind, he was already smashing it to the ground. Something sliced across his palm, and he bit back a scream and tried to draw back his hand, but something held it. He heard blood spurt from the wound, and another sound he could not name, because he had never imagined such a thing. It was the sound of stone growing. You have served your people well, Makeo Nahuat Shihun. You have served the gods well. You will go far, but you will not lead your god. I am not the lord of the rains. Makeo ran from the hut, but could not bring himself to go to the village with the taint of the god on him. He feared that he would lead it into his home, so loudly did its last words echo in his ears. I will call you when it is time. Days passed, and the rains fell off, but still there were miracles. The trees bore fruit as never before, and corn sprouted like weeds around every village. Every dropped seed, every trash midden and compost pile became a garden. The land had never been generous, but now it clearly loved them. The people dreamed. In every village, one or more were struck with visions of the new sun soon to rise, and they spread the word throughout the Yucatec nation. Word came to Maceo's village of guerrilla fighters who plundered the abandoned army garrison at Valladolid and had mounted fierce, though sporadic, resistance to the attempts to reclaim the interior. The guerrillas called themselves jaguars after the first created men and wore spotted pelts that gave them sacred protection in the riotous new jungle. There was talk of a Maya state, of learning the old writing and reclaiming the old cities, of reviving the cult of the Chilambalam, the jaguar priests. Makeo, who had only wanted the billboards gone, only hoped that the white men were right. Makeo was devastated by his failure to dismiss the god of the idol. All that he knew of the old gods had told him, by the signs of the disaster, the identity of their savior. The Mayan gods were not immortals possessed of powers over nature. The powers were the gods, the forces of the spirit world manifesting in matter to shepherd the world through its fragile cycle. The gods did not merely create the earth and sun and moon, they became it, and peopled and provisioned the earth with the sacrifice of their own flesh and blood. They did not beget offspring, but unfolded into new forms, donned new masks, as the currents of the spirit realm demanded. The uncreated creator, Hunabku, unfolded into four sons who were also one, Itzamna, and Itzamna erected the tree of life, and raised the heavens, parted the water from the land. Then he, they, unfolded into lesser gods to wield the powers of nature. If the god of rains was not their savior, then it must be some higher iteration of him, and Makeo shivered with the thought of challenging such a power with no knowledge, even of whom he faced. Such were his thoughts when he left home to work and found himself facing a jaguar on the trail. Its muzzle was crusted with blood, its jade eyes avid with a man-eater's cunning. It lay down on the trail and licked its forepaw. If this was not the monster that carried off the baby, it still needed killing, and Makeo drew a bead on it with his shotgun. He tensed and fired at the disinterested jaguar, but both shells cracked and blew only sour smoke. Makeo made to run, but the jaguar fixed him with his brazen gaze, with its brazen gaze, and padded away down the trail, looking back, clearly, to command him to follow. They moved east, 
alongside the ruined old road for nearly three hours. Once, they heard a helicopter pass overhead, and later, a truck loaded with soldiers hobbled by on the broken road. The soldiers wore rubber masks that made them look like giant insects, and carried rifles with bayonets affixed. Makeo found fruit to eat and spring water in fissures in the rocky ground, and the jaguar waited whenever he fell behind. He knew full well whose business he was about, and he grasped his machete in anticipation of the moment he might use it on the beast. Almost noon, the jaguar stopped and sat facing a clearing in which Makeo could make out slashes of white through the green. He sped up, all fantasies about killing the jaguar lost as he stumbled out into the open ground. A car, a new white Volkswagen painted as a taxi, was parked in the clearing. Makeo looked, but saw no one inside or anywhere else around. Get in the car. A booming voice commanded, a voice from within. Makeo could count the number of times he'd been inside a car or truck on one hand, and he had only driven once when Ilario had stolen a villager's truck and gotten too drunk to return it. He hated the things he knew now more than the billboards, but they were so much a part of the invaders' lives that he'd never dreamed of living in a place they did not ruin with their noise and exhausts. Now, after weeks of blessed quiet and sweet, clean air, he could not imagine why he was getting into this one. He made the climb into the back, but the voice barked, Get behind the wheel, Makeo Shiwin. The god's voice came from the car's radio, crackling with static and the flapping of the blown speakers. Whose taxi is this? I will not steal. It is yours, Makeo Shiwin. Get in. But I have never driven, he lied. I don't know how. I will teach you. Only get in and tarry no longer, for we have business in the city. There was no city of Cancun until 1975, by the Zul reckoning, when Makeo's daughter was old enough to walk. Now, over 700,000 people lived there, an army of slaves to serve the tourists' hordes. And the hordes had descended in their tens of thousands, for the high season was gearing up, and something else that the radio had told him about, a great gathering of the masters of wealth from all over the world. The radio had told him other things as he clumsily steered the taxi onto the very edge of the unbroken road that led east to the coast highway. The soldiers sent in to patrol the interior had come back with a fever, six had died in Merida, and hundreds more were sick all around the disaster area. The jaguar had guided him out of the quarantine zone. Makeo had heard of no one falling ill, at least none of his people. He asked his god about it, but the radio only played more news, and then some appalling parody of music. In Cancun, Makeo turned off the highway and down one of the twisted city avenues with a sense of creeping dread. Everything crawled with heat haze and the reek of its own consumption, as if the whole city smoldered, just short of bursting into flames. The god had not answered any of his questions, so he drove aimlessly, creeping along with the light traffic. At Siesta, only the tourists and their slaves were on the streets, from one traffic circle to the next. He had only been into the city a few times, and his feeble driving talents were not equal to the subtle insanities of the city. He learned all the traffic signs the hard way, only to realize no one else paid them any heed. Twice his taxi was hit by other cars who blandly cursed him and drove on, but he gave as good as he got. When he stopped at a circle and tried to dope out what was expected of him to cross it, a white man and woman climbed into the back seat and demanded something or someone called Burger King. Makeo could not bring himself to order them out, let alone explain that he was lost and on a mission from a faceless, bloodthirsty god, and so could not take them to Burger King, when the radio blared static and his god said, Take them. 
Mikhail let his foot off the brake and the car rolled. The radio told him where to turn and when to stop, when to go. The couple Americans from Texas, they said again and again, ordered him to shut off the radio, but Mikhail repeated the words the radio told him to say, and they subsided. Mikhail did not know whether to cry or laugh as his god steered him through downtown Cancun to the Burger King on An Avenida Tulum. But when he fought the taxi to a stop in front of the big orange charnel house, they were gone. The doors were shut, and the woman's big nylon beach bag still sat on the floor, but the seat, tattered vinyl draped in a colorful blanket his wife might have woven, was empty. It was also red and wet. It was suddenly very cold in the taxi. Where did they go? Makeo screamed, looking out the windows. A few people passed on the sidewalk. A jeep filled with blonde girls went by on the street, throwing suntan lotion and condoms at anything that moved. One moment ago, they were there, honking and groaning in their native tongue, and then the pools of red shrank as the seat drank them up like rain on desert sand. As he watched, horrified, the last traces of tourist blood seeped into the thirsty blanket, and there was nothing but the bag. And now there was not even that, for when he looked again, it was simply not. Drive on, said the radio. Pick up another one. Makeo picked up twelve more fares before sunset. Nine got out. He didn't look at them. He could hardly bear to look at the road, and whenever he passed the flashing red lights of a Federales cruiser or one of the wagons rounding up mobs of early disorderly drunks, galvanic twitches and rivers of cold sweat spurted out of him, filling him with the impulse to leap out of the car and run, as if there were anywhere safe to run to in this damned place. His god gave him directions that only he seemed to hear, and in between, when he was alone in the taxi, the god never stopped talking. This land is yours, Makeo Shihun, son of the Chilam Balam. Look at what they do to it. Does it please you? I have no power over them. Their blood is not ours. Their spirits are thin and pale. And this land is no longer ours to rule. They have paved it and poisoned the ocean and made it as their own. If I would cleanse the land of them, I must know their essence, their blood. Silent, Makeo drove. He could plead for mercy for the invaders, but why? When had they ever shown anything but contempt for the Maya? Even now, when the interior had cast them out, they had given no thought to evacuating the Indians, even now, with a plague at their door, they only seemed to eat and drink more to forget their peril. He, he said nothing, for what he felt, he realized, was not guilt or remorse, but merely fear of being caught. He was a man, and so he swallowed his fear and drove on. A gang of men in black balaclavas ran in front of his taxi, carrying bottles with rags stuffed in their necks. One of them slapped a sticker on the taxi's windshield, Uno mundo si, WTO no. A horde of well-dressed men and women swarmed out of a towering hotel at the end of the street and scattered into the street, just ahead of the masked men. Stop here, said the radio. Makeo braked, and almost immediately, a fare climbed into the taxi on the passenger side. He looked them over once and knew that they would not reach their destination. A sunburned blonde man, blind and half-dead with drink, slid across the seat behind Makea with his arm around a whore, who instantly ducked into the nest of his lap and resumed her vocation. Another man, balding, with bold, aristocratic features, fell in beside her and slammed the door. "'Take us to La Boom or take us to hell!' he shouted in Spanish. "'Do as he says,' the radio added. The taxi inched down the street to the next traffic circle as the stream of protesters became a river of angry masked men waving signs and sticks and torches. Fuck them, the bald man said. The bald man said, 
snorting a heavy spoonful of cocaine from a kit he stowed in his beautiful suit. Emboldened by the drug, he hung out the window as the taxi turned off the embattled avenue and screamed, Fuck you, you fucking communists! The blonde man attempted to sing something, then gasped and smacked the whore who screamed and giggled. Maceo listened very carefully for the voice of his god, but the radio gave only static. You, the bald man accused, and Maceo flinched, met his eyes in the mirror. You were a working man, but you were not stupid, no? You hate the communists, right? Maceo shrugged. There were all kinds of names for the games that Zul invaders played, but all of them left the Indians with nothing. We are trying to make a life better for them, a better life for you, you understand? And, and they come here to fuck it up, to make a mess of your beautiful city. We are not tyrants, we want to bring prosperity, you know? Beautiful harvest for all. I, I am an investment banker. Do you know what that is? Makeo shrugged again, but the banker wasn't looking at him anyway. I, I am like a magician, you know? I, I make wealth. People pray to me, they say, make it rain, and I make it rain money. And factories grow, good houses, hotels all over the world, and everybody is very happy and fat. Except these fucking communists, they want everybody to fucking starve and live in shitty little huts in the forest like fucking Indians, you know? They want to destroy a better life for you and yours, right? La boom! The blonde man roared and vomited out his window. Yes, this, yeah, this club, you been there? This club, is it good? The banker asked, then chuckled as he saw his own joke. The horse screeched and disengaged herself from the blonde man. Her hair matted with vomit, her face a mask of smeared makeup and the invader's seed, she looked around, and Makeo saw her eyes in the mirror. Papa? Makeo bit the tip off his tongue and looked out the window. Federales rolled past in the other direction, lights and sirens making a frenzied discotheque of the narrow street. Take them, he whispered. Hey, idiot, is this the way to La Boom or not? The blonde man forced the whore's head back down. She punched and scratched him and, judging by his screams, bit him. Papa, they made me. Take them! Makeo screamed. The car got very cold. Makeo kept his eyes shut. All three of them screamed. Makeo turned the radio up as loud as it would go. Horns honked in chorus behind him. Blood flooded his mouth. He spat it out and opened his eyes. The street was empty before him, the noise of the cars behind him growing louder. He stepped on the gas and the car rolled, and he let it roll back to Avenida Tulum and the highway. We are satisfied said the radio, as if he didn't know it. The full moon cast the jungle in ghostly silver tones, so that Makeo seemed to drive through Shibalba, the land of the dead, as he returned home. The superstitious fear only hardened as he turned off the coast highway and into the interior, for he saw nothing that truly lived. He parked the taxi in the clearing where he found it, and walked the trail that shadowed the road. The army had set up a checkpoint not far from where he'd parked, and soldiers in masks and goggles stood behind a barricade across the edge of the sinkhole that had swallowed the tour bus. Even behind the rubber masks, he could hear them coughing. Somewhere on the trail, he almost fell into a pit that had been covered with brush. A soldier lay at the bottom, impaled on a bed of wooden stakes. A nest of baby vipers slithered over the corpse and bit its broken, bloated flesh. Makeo went around the pit and forced himself to go slowly, watching out for traps. Once he saw an iguana lazing across the trail, and just beyond it he spotted a tripwire strung between two trees. Unasked for, the god was protecting him, for he was still useful. Seeing what had become of the land, Makeo began to take heart, for he feared, now, that he knew which god he had called up. 
When he finally stumbled into his village, he cast off all caution, for the compound was alight with torches and candles, and all the people were in the open, beneath the canopy of the spreading seba tree. Mikhail called out, heart sick, that someone else had died. His wife came to him and hugged him. Where have you been, you fool? The jaguars are about, and the army has been coming and going on the road all night. They're burning the villages along the road. He kissed her, and though he tasted the caramel flavor of Pepsi on her lips, he held his tongue, which had only just stopped bleeding. I had to go into the city. Then you know more than we do, said Ilario, who came up to them and held up a battery radio. The man on the radio says there's a, that there's a great fire in Cancun. And the water is making people sick. Mikhail shook his head, numb. Could it happen so fast? I saw... Husband, Manuela is in the city. Our sons are at the hotels. Nothing will happen to them. Wife, Mikhail's mouth said the words. We are the people of the land. Our blood will save us as it washes the invaders away. If... If they are pure... Ilario offered him a drink, which he took. The jaguars are, have told the people to leave their villages and hide in the jungle, but the soldiers have ordered everyone to stay in their homes. Nobody can decide what to do, Mikhail. I... I will find out what we should do, Mikhail mumbled and pulled free of them. He walked alone into the jungle. The hut had been almost completely engulfed by hungry vines and he only blundered into it because of the three-legged dog that he startled out of the darkness of its doorway. Shaking with exhaustion, Makeo knelt down on the carpet of mold spreading out from the darkest corner of the hut. O oh Lord, humbly have I served, humbly have I offered the blood of my enemies, and sobs choked his voice. I have given you what you demanded, and I have beheld your works. And I know you for what you are. Lord Kami, ruler of Shibalba, the Nine Hells. Your feast has glutted the land of the dead, and the world cannot abide your harvest any longer. Go back and leave the living in peace. As he spoke, a terrible energy seized him and drove him to strike out. His hands reached into the cowl of shadow where he'd carved the god, and his knuckles grazed the mossy, the mossy plaster wall. The idol was gone. Laughter shook the hut. You are very shrewd. Makeo she wouldn't, but you are blind. I am not Lord Kame or any of your ancestors' gods. These sacrifices, the blood that flows, are not for me. They are for you. Makeo ran back to the village as fast as he could, and only stopped at the edge of the clearing, though he could see that all the roofs were burning from very far away. He sank into a pile on the trail uh, behind the pyre of his home. Soldiers swept up the last of the bodies under the flaming Saiba tree, tossing them onto a raging bonfire. One of the soldiers raised his mask and coughed out a freshet of bright red blood. One of his comrades shot him in the head, and they added him to the pile, climbed into a truck, and rolled away. Makeo lay still as the stars turned and the moon rolled like a curious eye across the night sky. Then, after a while, he got up again. The stars began to die out in the east, but the glow of dawn was the ruddy purple of bruised flesh. Makeo stumbled out of his village and went to the highway. The truck sat astride the road, stuffed to bursting with dead soldiers. A few bodies scattered on the road wore jaguar pelts, or paint. The ground, dr 
drank their blood with an almost audible slurping sound, Makeo climbed into the truck and drove east. No one challenged him at the checkpoint. Soldiers lay dead everywhere with or without their masks on. Here and there he saw the candles of pilgrims in the jungle on either side of the road. They headed east, too, towards the dawn. On the coast highway, he saw signs of another broken-down roadblock, but the huge truck crushed effortlessly through the ragged line of burning cruisers. As the sun began to rise red over the ocean, he broke the barricades around the tourist center for the ruins of Zama, the city of dawn. This, he thought, was where the idol would come to be worshipped, the last outpost of the old Maya civilization. Zama was a pitiful miniature of the greater glories of Koba and Chichen, but the pyramid called the castle, perched on the lava rock cliffs overlooking the tranquil azure sea, was the most beautiful vista in all the Yucatan. It was a holy site to his ancestors, who had believed as their empire sagged into decay and the empire swept in from across the once infinite ocean, that each day the sun might lose its battle with the night, and might fail to rise forever if it was not fed. Makeo jumped down from the truck, and ascended the palisade around the city, stepped through the narrow gate in the outer wall around the city, uncertain when to, what to expect. Unable to hear any sounds over the rushing of blood in his ears, so like the roar of crowds, he stepped out into Zama, alone. The ruin slumbered, frozen columned buildings of white stone, crawling with bougainvillea vines and drowsy iguanas. The roar he'd heard was only the tumbling surf. Where, then? He went back to the truck and drove out onto the coast highway until he found a group of pilgrims in the woods and used them as beacons. They led south from Zama to the most unlikely of places, but Makeo was beyond weighing ironies as he got out of the truck and ran to the entrance of the hotel. It was called the Grand Mayan and to its credit it strove mightily to emulate what a mayan emperor if not a god might choose to build for a palace molded limestone bas reliefs mocked makeo with their cryptic pictographs and a towering obelisk bearing the faces of the gods drooled water into an elaborate fountain in the open lobby the desks were abandoned and makeo saw no people anywhere a few pieces of luggage lay here and there, as if dropped during an evacuation, but he also noticed rigid puddles of candle wax in a more or less straight line through the lobby and out across the hotel's grounds, and Makeo followed the trail. By now, he was so far past any plan, any hope for himself or his people, that he lived only to see. To understand, the blood of the Chilam Balam, the jaguar priests, flowed through his veins only until he could find the appropriate venue in which to spill it. Long before he found the beach, at the end of a tangle of trails through manicured stands of jungle with sterile pa paved lagoons, and every kind of toy and extravagance secreted at every turn, he could hear the voice of his people. They chanted, and something answered in a voice that dwarfed their own. Giant, golden, arera ants scourged his legs, and butterflies battered his face, but he slouched on through the thinning stands of mangrove trees, where the soil became sand, and where there should have been an ocean, there it was, but it was made of people, and the waves were arms raised and flailing at the sky, and the roar of the worship, their joy, drowned out the surf. And before them, a poured concrete step pyramid on the shore 
a fantastic half-size replica of the castle at Chichen Itza, but for the feathered serpent water slides running down its flanks, and atop that, Makeo alone saw the god that he had carved out of the earth, for all the other worshippers averted their eyes. In outline, it was not unlike a man, though many times taller, and at first he took it for an armored image of Itzamna himself, for the long reptilian old man's face that glowered down at him resembled the idols Makeo had carved of that deity. But then it shifted, and he saw that its head was a television screen, and the face of the god competed for screen time with flashing advertisements, even as it fed on the adoration of the mob. Its body had grown from the stone Makeo had chiseled out of the ground, but it had added to its mass, adorning itself with all manner of talismans and banners of every color and material, until it resembled the walking billboards who drove the invaders' fast racing cars. Neon veins and embedded video screens flickered and popped all over the monstrosity, its flashing divine flesh touting soda, gasoline, hamburgers, handguns, cigarettes, while hissing ports and hoses all over its body dispensed these commodities in showers that brought fresh waves of exaltation from the crowd, and yet he saw that it was hollow, for fissures and cracks ran throughout its misshapen form, out of which licked green flames. Acolytes and jaguar pelts and paint led bound captives, hotel employees and guests, up the steps of the pyramid, and a priest threw wide the door in the idol's chest. The acolytes threw a howling captive into the flames, and the crowd's screams cracked the sky. Makeo had caused all of this to be. The voice of the god had been his own voice, after all. He had learned, at last, why his people had turned their backs on gods. The god bellowed, and the crowd surged around Makeo and bore him into the air, passed him over their heads to the steps of the pyramid, and drove him up until he sagged to his knees before the god. How now, Makeo Shihun, it crowed, your land is your own again, and the new age is upon us. The world shall tremble before the might of the people of the living God. Makeo bowed his head, but not in worship. He could not bear to look upon it, let alone smell it any longer. I gave you no sacrifice, but you took from me. You took it all. You took all that I prayed you to protect. I took nothing from you, Makeo Nawa. She hunt the life force took your wife, your daughter. It must be fed. There can be no rebirth without death. It waved one bulldozer claw at the south. The smoke of Cancun burning was a door one hundred miles high hanging open, and beyond lay starless night. Blood moves the sun through the heavens. But my appetites are more... Sudden. Makeo bit his lip. Were you so treacherous with my ancestors? But I am not the god of your ancestors, the god laughed. I am your god. And you did give me tribute. Your hate made me Makeo Shihun. It fed me. And so I fed it. Spirit. Feeding matter, matter, feeding spirit, as with all things. Your sacrifice birthed me into the world and gave me flesh, power, worship. I am nothing but hate now. So take this as your last sacrifice, said Makeo, laying bare his throat and looking up 
to the red gold ruin of dawn. Take my life. I already have your life, do I not? His god said, and I have much use for it in this world. The god leaned down into his face. Dewage, diesel, sewage, sex, death, breath, making him gag. He met its gaze for a moment, hoping this was only a joke. He would still have me be your priest. No, Makeo Shihun, I would have you drive a cab. Makeo's face fell to the ground, so he had the small mercy that he did not see the face of his god as it added, In Mexico City.